Hello, mystery aficionados. Tonight, we finally break into layer 5 of the Unsolved Mysteries Mega Iceberg Explained. If it's as fun as the first four layers, then I cannot wait. But before we dive in, I'd like to ask you to take a second to subscribe if you haven't already. And if you would like to support the channel, there's a link in the description below. With that being said, dim the lights, grab some popcorn, and a Diet Mountain Dew. Put your seat in the incline position. We are about to wade out deep into a pool of mysteries. The Monster with 21 Faces On March 18th, 1984, at around 2 p.m., two men, armed with a pistol and rifle, which is later assumed to be toys, would enter the home of Katsuhisa Ezeki, who was then the president of a food processing company known as Ezeki Glico. The two had made their way in by stolen key they had taken from the home next door which belonged to Ezeki's 70-year-old mother, where the two had broken into, and tied her up with a telephone line. Now as the two were in Ezeki's home, they would tie up his wife, Makayako, 35, and their 7-year-old daughter. The man would then cut the telephone lines and find Katsuhisa, who was taking a bath, and abduct him. They would then demand a ransom. The plot did not work, however, because Ezeki was able to break free of his ropes three days later and make his escape. By April 8th, the abductors, now known as the Monster with 21 Faces, would send a taunting letter to the police. The criminal would then follow this up by setting several vehicles ablaze at the Ezeki Glico's headquarters, and then on April 16th, a plastic container full of hydraulic acid was found inside the Glico company that was built in Ibaraki, Osaka, the same city where Ezeki was held captive. There was also a letter left nearby demanding a ransom be paid to stop the harassment of the company. Meanwhile, the monster with 21 faces would send more letters to the media, taunting the police whose efforts had failed to capture them. Finally, on May 10th, the monster would send another letter to Ezeki Glico and stated that it had laced $21 million worth of the company's confections with potassium cyanide and it later threatened to put them on the store shelves. The company had no choice but to remove all of the Glico products from the stores resulting in a loss of more than $20 million, about $58 million in today's money. For what it's worth, no poison candies were found. By the time it was all said and done, Glico would lose about $130 million, or $380 million in today's money. This man, it seemed, clearly hated Glico, which makes it stranger that a month later, the monster would issue a message claiming they forgave Glico, and then the harassment of the company stopped. And even stranger, Glico would tell authorities they had not paid a ransom to this person. The suspect would then move on to other companies. The monster would state that 20 packages of Moranaga candy had been laced with sodium cyanide. Police would search and this time actually found over a dozen lethal packages of candy that were thankfully all pulled before anyone could be poisoned. Three more companies were threatened with a campaign of similar harassment and terror if they did not comply and give the monster large sums of money. After this, police superintendent Yamamoto of Shiga Prefecture would commit suicide after being unable to catch the perpetrator. Five days after this, the monster would send his last letter where they would offer condolences. They would then close by saying they were through and that if anyone else tried to blackmail these companies, they were copycats. After this letter, they were never heard from again and the statute of limitations expired. As far as suspects go, one man was captured on security camera, putting a piece of Glico chocolate on a store shelf. The man's face was captured from the side. Investigators believe this is the monster with 21 faces. Another man that was identified as helping the monster with 21 faces was a man known simply as the Fox-Eyed Man, who was spotted by a detective on a train during one investigation. When it was all said and done, the criminals were said to have never received any of the money they had requested and that their motives are still unclear. But it is quite possible that these food companies secretly paid the ransom and never disclosed that publicly. 0888-888-888 The phone number that I just stated is a Bulgarian phone number with a spooky story. The number is said to be jinxed and has actually been permanently retired by the phone company. So what could actually prompt such an action? The first owner of this cursed number was a CEO 
of the actual issuing company itself, a man named Vladimir Grashnov. Shortly after acquiring the number in 2001, he would die of cancer at the age of 48. The number would then be given to a mafia member named Konstantin Dimitrov, who would be killed in 2003 by an assassin in the Netherlands. The third owner was a businessman named Konstantin Dislyev, who was killed in 2005 outside of an Indian restaurant in Sofia. That man's murder is still unsolved, and ever since that death, the number has been suspended, and whoever calls it will hear a message that says, Outside Network Coverage. Even weirder, when Mobitel, the company that owns the number, has been asked about this, they have always said they have no comment to make. It should be noted that the last two victims of this curse were involved in criminal operations, meaning their chances of dying early were substantially higher. Still, I ask you, is this a curse number or just bad luck? 1994 Ruwa UFO Incident On September 16, 1994, at around 10 a.m., right outside of Ruwa, Zimbabwe, students at a private school would take their mid-morning break. These children, aged in range between 6 and 12, as they were outside, the students would see what they claimed was one or more silver craft descending from the sky and landing on a field near the school. They would then state that they had seen between one to four gray creatures with big eyes and dressed all in black. Some of the students even said they looked a bit like Michael Jackson. They had a large head, scrawny neck, long black hair, shiny black clothing or skin, no facial expression, stiff necks, and ran in slow motion. Other reports claimed to have seen them running up and down on top of a spaceship, and others reported seeing these beings hovering. The beings would then approach the children and communicate with them telepathically. At this point, many of the children ran away, but most of the older students remained. The message delivered by these beings would be that of an environmental theme, frightening the children and causing some of them to cry. The entire incident lasted about 15 minutes. The kids would go back in to tell the teachers, who understandably didn't believe such a tale, even though strangely, 62 in total would all tell the same version of events. That night, the students would go home and tell their parents, who called the school to ask what had happened. Why was their child freaking out? Reporters would hear of the story three days later and go to interview students and staff. The children drew pictures of what they had seen, and again, all the students told pretty much the same story. They also remained adamant that what they had seen was not an airplane. This would end up going down as one of the most famous UFO cases of the 1990s and one of the most famous ever in Africa. Skeptics have claimed that it was nothing more than mass hysteria or maybe even a prank. They have pointed out that several other children reported not seeing anything that day and there's also a theory that it was puppets. Yes, puppets. More specifically, the African Research and Education Puppetry Program, aka AREP, apparently at this time, was taking a puppet show and making its way around the country to inform rural Africans about the AIDS health crisis, as well as other social programs, such as pollution, which would explain a lot of things, from how they looked to the telepathic communication the students would have claimed to have witnessed. But to me, that one seems like a bit of a stretch. In the 2010s, some of these former students, who are now adults, would be interviewed about the experience, and they all stuck to their story, leaving this one still as an unsolved mystery. Abigail Williams In early 1692, Abigail Williams was living with her cousin, Betty Paris, and her uncle, Samuel Paris, the village pastor, and two slaves, Tituba and John Indian. Now Tituba, she was part of a group of three women that stayed together a lot and socialized, that of Sarah Good and Sarah Osborne. And on February 29th, 11-year-old Abigail, along with 9-year-old Betty Paris, would be among the first children to accuse someone of witchcraft when they would point the finger at these three women. The accusation said the women's ghosts were afflicting the young girls of the Paris household. The three women would be arrested and questioned separately, and like a lot of people would do in this situation, even though they were completely innocent, the women began to turn on one another. And long story short, Sarah Osborne would eventually die in prison, and Sarah Good was executed on July 19th, 
with four other women. The Paris household and other citizens would continue to accuse others, which led to the imprisonment of hundreds and the deaths of more than 20. Abigail herself gave testimony at seven cases and was involved in 17 capital cases, and you probably already know this story. But the mystery here is, what happened to Abigail Williams afterwards? After this one documented account of her, she completely disappears from the record. We know nothing about her parents, or where she came from, or how she began living with the Paris family, and we have no idea where she went after the Salem witch trials. We don't even know where her grave is, and there's not really a good answer, but there's a few theories. One is that Reverend Samuel Paris, her uncle, sent her away to prevent her from participating in any more of the witch trials because the townsfolk were understandably very upset and many of them wanted to see the girls punished, which is exactly why the Reverend sent his own daughter Betty away, but there's no record that he sent Abigail off. In a 2002 book called The Salem Witch Trials, a day-by-day -day chronicle of a community under siege by Marilyn K. Roach, the author would claim that Abigail died before 1697, if not way sooner, haunted to the end of her life about what had happened. Yet, there is no proof of this. The author seemed to be referencing a vague line from a book in 1697 called A Modest Inquiry into the Nature of Witchcraft, which stated that an anonymous afflicted girl suffered from, quote, diabolical manifestation, end quote, until her death. And since three of the girls, Abigail Williams, Elizabeth Hubbard, and Mary Warren, are all unaccounted for in the records at the time, it is possible he was referring to Abigail. There are other rumors, though, that she fled to a city far away on the East Coast, possibly Boston, where it's said by some accounts she became a prostitute. Agatha Christie's Disappearance Agatha Christie was an English writer mainly known for her 64 detective novels and 14 short story collections. Particularly, the stories revolving around fictional detectives Hercule Poirot and Miss Marple. She is even listed by Guinness World Records as the best-selling fiction writer of all time, selling more than 2 billion copies. So it's somewhat ironic that one of the best mystery writers of all time was at the center of her own mystery in 1926. Christie had married a man named Archibald Christie in 1914, and by 1926, after years of writing, Agatha would finally start to make some real money when she received an advance of 200 pounds for a novel. Despite her success, she insisted on living a modest lifestyle and kept a tight rein on the money, which is rumored to have led to tensions in the marriage with Archie. The issue would eventually lead to him having an affair with his 25-year-old secretary, Nancy Neal. This would lead to a turbulent time for Agatha, obviously, because right before the affair, her mother had also passed away. And now, Archie was caught in an affair, and to make matters worse, he asked for a divorce. And on that December 3rd, the couple would argue, and Archie left the home to spend the weekend with friends, which included his mistress. Agatha would leave their daughter with the maid, and left that same evening. The next morning, her car was found by the police, abandoned several miles away, submerged in the bushes, in what appeared to be a car accident. The driver was missing, but the headlights were on, and a suitcase and coat remained in the back seat, which just made the whole thing stranger. And overnight, the writer, who was still virtually unknown at this time, become front page news. A reward was offered for any credible sightings or evidence. Police would launch a massive search, which included 10 to 15,000 people who were aided by many types of tracking dogs. A lake would also be dredged as police now feared that she may have drowned. And meanwhile, suspicion started to grow around Archie and Nancy. But 10 days later, a waiter at the Hydropathic Hotel in Harrogate, Yorkshire, would contact the police with some surprising news. Apparently, a lively and outgoing guest from South Africa by the name of Teresa Neal was staying there. And this woman, Teresa, was actually Agatha Christie in disguise, nearly 184 miles away from her home. Archie would travel with the police to the hotel and would sit down in the dining room, where he watched his estranged wife walk in, take her place at another table, and begin reading a newspaper. When approached by Archie, witnesses noted Agatha's puzzled response, as if she didn't know him. Doctors diagnosed her with, quote, 
an unquestionable, genuine loss of memory, end quote. But opinions of what really happened have been divided ever since. Making things more confusing was Christy had written several confusing letters to her husband and others before vanishing. One to her brother-in-law that said she was going for a vacation in Yorkshire. Another one to a local chief constable that said she feared for her life. Some stated that the death of her mother and embarrassment of her husband's affair led to a nervous breakdown. Others thought the whole thing was nothing more than a publicity stunt to promote the little-known author. Archie would tell the press that she had suffered a possible concussion, which led to the memory loss. Another theory, though, was that Agatha had planned the whole thing to embarrass her husband, but did not anticipate the story becoming so huge, while some thought it was an attempt to frame her husband for murder. One final theory in this one that I find interesting was that she never planned to go back home or to go back to her life, so it's kind of weird to wonder what if she had adopted a new identity and that identity become one of the best writers ever. Something to think about. Shortly after this, Agatha and Archie would split up, and the two never spoke about the disappearance again. Agatha didn't even mention it in her autobiography. Altered State of Consciousness, also known as Altered State of Mind, is basically any condition other than being awake. The most obvious form of Altered State of Consciousness is obviously sleeping, but there are a few others, such as one form that has caught on in recent years, that of an isolation tank. But there's also certain drugs like LSD and mushrooms which can bring on an altered state of mind, as well as meditation and near-death experiences. And finally, hypnosis, which is still debated on if it is an altered state of mind or not. The mystery in this one basically comes down to researchers' limited understanding of how it works. I mean, it's easily observable just look at someone sleeping. However, that does little to actually make us understand the mechanisms behind the altered state of mind. For one reason, the experience is very subjective, and it varies widely from person to person, making it almost impossible to study. This is further complicated by the fact that each individual's altered state can be influenced by personal beliefs or emotional states. Hence, a religious person is more apt to possibly see angels or what they believe is heaven in a near-death experience, while someone grieving the loss of a loved one could possibly see that individual. Finally, the brain itself. It's just not understood which parts of the brain are responsible for an altered state of consciousness. Bat Squatch. The Bat Squatch is a flying cryptid that was allegedly seen near Mount St. Helens starting in the 80s. It appears to be a flying primate. The first sightings happened shortly after Mount St. Helens erupted, where there were several reports of a creature with an ape-like body and large leathery wings and a pair of glowing eyes spotted in the area. But the most famous and most detailed encounter happened in April of 1994, when Brian Canfield was driving through Pierce County in Washington. When his truck suddenly died, he tried to start the pickup several times, but nothing happened. He was about to get out and take a closer look when something swooped across his headlights. He first thought it was a large bird, but when the creature landed on his hood, he knew it wasn't a bird. He would later describe it as a human-like nine-foot-tall creature with bat-like wings and a coat of blue fur that had large fangs with glowing red eyes. Strangely, after the creature flew off, Christopher's truck started back up. This would be the lone sighting for years, so many people dismissed it as nothing more than a hoax. But in 2007, Another possible sighting occurred near Mount Shasta, California. Several hikers reported seeing a huge creature with leathery wings spanning up to an amazing 50 feet fly out of a crevice in the mountain. One witness described the creature as looking like a flying fox bat. This would be followed in June 2011 by a man walking his dog when he would see something in the sky that had bat wings, blue fur, and a face with glowing red eyes, and once again, he claimed it stood about 9 feet tall. Finally, the last documented sighting came on April 14, 2014 at Archbishop Hoban High School in Akron, Ohio, as an entire class would witness a black mass race by the window of the classroom at an incredible speed. It again was claimed to have been about 9 feet tall. So what was this creature? That I cannot say. Bear Brook Jane Doe 
On November 10, 1985, a hunter in Bear Brook State Park in Allentown's New Hampshire would come across a gruesome discovery. The man would see a 55-gallon drum near a burned-down store. Curious, he went to open it. Inside, he found the bodies of an adult female and young girl, both wrapped in plastic. After calling authorities, an autopsy would be ordered, which determined that both had died from blunt force trauma, and at the time, while DNA was still in its infancy, there was no way for authorities to identify the victims. All they knew was that the woman was aged between 23 and 33, and the girl was aged between 8 and 10. Years would go by with no progress being made, and then on May 9, 2000, it would only get more complicated when the remains of two young girls were found near the first discovery site. These bodies, too, were in a metal 55-gallon drum and had also died from blunt force trauma. These children were estimated to be between 2 and 4 and 1 and 3. Investigators were certain that the four murders had occurred roughly at the same time. In fact, it would be revealed that during the original investigation in 1985, police had searched the area for more remains and never found this drum, which they later attributed to being too far outside the proximity of the first one. It would take 14 years for DNA profiling to finally establish that three of the victims were maternally related, which obviously meant she could have been their mother, but possibly even an aunt or older sister. A year later, this would be narrowed down even more when it was established that the woman was the mother to at least two of these children. Furthermore, it was shown that the woman and children lived together in the northeastern U.S. between two weeks and three months before their death. And this mystery is probably not going the direction you think, because we actually know the guilty party. A man named Robert Evans was identified as being the father of the middle child, but not related to the other victims, but he was still the prime suspect. It was also learned that the name Robert Evans was an alias, and by 2017, the man was finally identified by DNA as Terry Rasmussen, who was also known as the Chameleon Killer, who had several aliases. Unfortunately, he had already died in prison in 2010 for the 2002 murder of his wife. Two years later in 2019, New Hampshire authorities would announce the identities of three of the victims. The female adult was Marlise Honeychurch, who was the mother of Marie Elizabeth Vaughn and Sarah McWaters, all who went missing from California around Thanksgiving 1978 when she was dating Rasmussen. So where is the mystery? That would be the identity of the fourth victim, the two to four year old, whom detectives still have no idea who she is. They do know that Rasmussen was her father, but there was no identity made for the mother, and it's unknown if that woman is even still alive. By 2021, they would state that they believed the child's mother had relatives in Pearl River County, Mississippi, but the girl herself was possibly from Texas, Arizona, California, or Oregon. She had wavy brown hair and possibly had anemia during her life. This one is pretty active, and it's just my guess, but I believe this girl will be identified fairly soon. Ben Nevis Screams Ben Nevis is the highest mountain in Scotland and is a very popular destination, with an estimated 130,000 climbers going to the top every year. The cliffs provide challenges of all difficulties, attracting expert and amateur climbers alike. But what it's most known for is its ice climbing. And it's on one of these ice climbs that we find our next mystery when producer slash journalist Christopher Slate would scale the icy mountain with a friend in early 2015. He would report that the ice was perfect and climbing was going well. He would come to a stop and had his back wedged against a rock wall, resting as he placed an ice screw in. Suddenly, he would hear a scream. He recorded it at first it sounded slightly muffled, but quickly became sharp and into focus. The climber would record that it was the most visceral, awful sound he had ever heard. The noise would scare him, enough that he instantly knew something terrible had happened, and the first image that came to his mind was someone screaming as they watched their loved one fall to their death. He would begin to panic and just wanted to be off his climb, so he'd make his way up to the stopping point and would begin discussing the scream with his partner trying to figure out where it had came from and what might have happened. The two knew they would need to get out fast and go report it. Chris would eventually run into other climbers 
that were in the same area, and they had also heard the scream. In fact, several of these mountaineers would leave their route to go try to find the person who had fell, yet nothing was found. When police were told about the incident, they could only confirm that no one had been reported missing. A search did begin, though, and nothing was found, leaving many to wonder to this day, just what did these climbers hear? One clue in this to remember was the mountaineers believed the scream was from someone who witnessed something awful, like a panicked wife or a girlfriend, not that the scream came from someone that was falling, which is odd because you would think that other person would have reported it. This has led to a few theories. One was that another climber was just trying to prank the others, but this has mostly been ruled out as pulling something like that could lead to the other mountaineers getting hurt trying to search for the fallen person. Another somewhat plausible theory is a hiker with his dog possibly witnessed his pet taking a tumble off the edge and falling to its death, hence the reason there was no report. After this, we have some more theories from nature that you may expect, like foxes, or Sika deer, or possibly even the wind. But we also have some more out there theories. One of the weirdest was that it was Barry Grylls, the adventurer known for his show, Man vs. Wild. He was actually recording video for his show that same day when the event occurred. Some believe he made the scream when he was trying to demonstrate something. However, his producers had denied it was him. Finally, there are the theories that it was a banshee or a cryptid said to inhabit the mountains called Gray Man. Black Demon The Black Demon Shark of Cortez is said to be an enormous black shark that lives somewhere off the coast of Mexico's Baja California Peninsula. In recent years, it has been spotted more often by local fishermen. It is said to be between 20 to 60 feet long and weighs between 50,000 to 100,000 pounds, which is just ginormous. It is described as looking like a white shark, but its color is black as night or like the color of ash. It is also said to have a mouth wide enough to consume a whale and also has a large whip-like tail that can be seen churning waves at the surface. It was first sighted in 2008, and it's said to be responsible for the alleged deaths of hundreds of whales and attacks on boats. Some theories speculate that it could be the Megalodon, which was a giant shark that went extinct millions of years ago. Others speculate that it's just an unusually large great white shark, or possibly a whale shark, or maybe even manta rays, Despite numerous expeditions to search for this creature, nothing concrete has been found. And if you're like me and spend a lot of time fishing and know a lot of fishermen, then you know you can ignore almost every story they tell you. Blood House at Fountain Drive, 1978 in Atlanta, Georgia. Minnie Winston was soaking in a bathtub at her home at Fountain Drive. The 77-year-old was taking some time to unwind as Minnie rarely had any time for herself as much as her life now, was devoted to taking care of her husband. But as Minnie got out of the tub, she would take a step and seen something bizarre. She would look down to see a puddle where she had just stepped and seen that it was red, and it appeared to be bubbling up through the floor. She immediately thought her frail husband Willie must have hurt himself. She would quickly go out into the hallway, calling his name. But before she could make it to the other room to check on him, she froze, because in the hallway, the red liquid was everywhere, along the baseboard, and smeared across the walls. The droplets were about dime to silver dollar sized. That's when this would turn into a real horror movie, because as she stood there, a geyser of blood shot through the wooden floor, further covering the hallway. She would finally make it to Willie's room, and awoke him and pointed out the blood. They would look over the rest of the home, and discovered that not only was it in the bathroom and hall, but in the kitchen and living room as well. The police were called, and detectives were obviously stupefied. An EMT came onto the scene, expecting to find that one of the Winstons was unknowingly injured. But nope, not a scratch on them. The property managers would also arrive with flashlights and found no burst pipes or anything that could explain the red liquid. They would, however, find more bloodstains on the television stand in the basement. After not being able to locate a body or a crime scene, Detectives were now certain that it was most likely paint or some kind of rusty fluid. The tenseness of the situation calmed as the investigators continued to look on for the source of the leak. However, 
the lab technician on scene, well, she found something else. After taking samples of the fluid that would go to the crime lab to be tested, she discovered that it was in fact human blood, more specifically, type O, and both the Winstons were type A. Atlanta PD held a press conference on September 10th and acknowledged that, quote, copious blood, end quote, was found in the home and belonged to neither of the Winstons. They admitted that it was an extremely strange situation, especially considering the home had been locked and alarm had been set. They began to canvas blood banks to see if any of the supplies had been stolen, but that came up to a dead end too. Now they had two mysteries to figure out. Just where did the blood come from, and how did the assailant get into the home? This became a big story, as media and onlookers crowded up outside the home and began knocking on the door asking questions. Even their postman was hit with a barrage of questions. Police would eventually begin to distance themselves from the investigation, with some law enforcement sources stating that it was most likely a hoax. There were also rumors that the Winston's adult daughters, who worked at a hospital, could have been responsible. As it was thought, the whole thing was set up in order to make their parents declared incompetent for financial reasons. Another theory was that an intruder had somehow been able to make his way into the home but was injured while doing so, and while looking for valuables to steal, realized he was hurt too bad and fled the scene. Although, the police were unable to find any signs of a break-in, and of course, there is the theory that the whole thing is of paranormal origins. Bloody Handprint In the 1860s, an Irish girl named Margaret Burke would arrive in Christchurch, New Zealand in search of a better life. She had applied for a position as domestic maid in the mansion of an influential politician named William Robinson. Now during this time, one of the things the affluent liked to do was to employ at least one manservant of color, and the Robinsons were no different. They would actually hire a black man from Santa Fe, Bogota, Colombia. This 28-year-old, Simon Sedeno, had actually been working at a hotel in Panama in 1867 when just by chance he met William Robinson, who was traveling through the canal. Robinson would ask the hotel owner for a reference on Simon, to whom the owner said he was a good employee. So just like that, Simon would board the ship back to New Zealand with Robinson, and he was a good servant too, at least according to Mrs. Robinson. She would record later on that he got along well with the other servants, but as time progressed, that would change, as Mrs. Robinson would witness him chasing one of the servant girls in a threatening manner after she had teased him. And even though Simon was odd and was sometimes quick to anger, the family did not suspect he was dangerous. I mean, they had gotten a good reference about the young man, but that reference? Yeah, that hotel owner actually lied because he knew Simon was a troublemaker. And this is where we come back to the first person in this story, Margaret or Maggie, as she went by. Apparently, Simon had taken a liking to her and would propose, to which she rejected. He became so enraged at her that he beat his fist on the table and threatened to beat her. After this, it went downhill fast. The other maids now would routinely tease him even more because apparently after his rejection, Simon made up this imaginary girlfriend to get the others to stop teasing him. Hey, we've all been there. But the girls knew that this girl didn't exist and made fun of him even more. It got so bad that he asked the Robinsons for permission to leave, to which they agreed on, but only if Simon made payment for the butler's clothes that had been provided to him, to which he didn't do or couldn't afford. Maggie and Kate, one of the other maids, were advised to stop teasing him as they now feared what he might do. The girls from this point would just ignore him completely, but it was too late because one day when Simon was cleaning the silverware, Maggie and Kate would start scrubbing in the kitchen. As the girls laughed about something unrelated, Simon would hear them, and although he could not make out what they said, he assumed it was about him. He would grab the bread knife and rushed at Kate, and viciously stabbed her in the face, throat, and breastbone. She would lose consciousness, but came back to and escaped out the back. By this time, Simon had turned on Maggie, who also got away from him. Meanwhile, a visitor at the home, Patrick Campbell, would hear the commotion as Maggie ran past him with Simon chasing her. 
Maggie would stumble, and Simone caught her and pulled her to the floor and started violently stabbing her in the left side of her chest and arm. Patrick would rush over to wrestle him off of Maggie, but not before he got one more stab into her. Mrs. Robinson then entered the room and demanded that he hand the knife over, and Simone did. He was then escorted to the police station, where he gave a full confession of the crime. Now I'll spare the details about the trial, since we still haven't even reached the mystery. But I will say that Kate lived and was a witness while Maggie died. Simone was found guilty and executed. Now to the mystery. The Robinsons family would pay for a very nice headstone in memory of Maggie. But strangely, years after she was laid to rest, the gray memorial stone would begin to partially oxidize, exposing a red mark. A red mark in the shape of a bloodied handprint. There were many attempts to try and clean it off, but no matter what was done, it couldn't be removed. Over the years, many people would travel from all around the world to see what became known as Maggie's bloody handprint. However, Maggie's grave is long since lost. Brandon Embry On September 9, 2019, a woman named Sarah Lee in Asheboro, North Carolina would exchange several texts with 33-year-old son Brandon Embry as the two stayed in regular contact. So it was strange to Sarah that the following day, she would only receive one text from him at 6.30 in the morning. At first, she tried not to be an overworried mom, but at some point later that day, she would begin to call him, and yet, he never answered. Again, she tried to put the thought off that something was wrong. The following day, she would call him again, and he did not answer. Again, not wanting to pry, she let it go. Until the next day, on the 12th, when she still had not heard from him, she and Brandon's sister, Rachel, would finally go over to his apartment. However, he never answered the door, even though his truck was parked outside. Sarah would now call the police, saying she knew something was wrong. She would also call the property manager to come unlock the door. When the officers entered, the first thing they noticed was how messy the place was. They also noted running water coming out of the back area where the bedrooms were, and in there, they found a naked Brandon unconscious on the floor near the door. He had numerous bruises, cuts, and lacerations on his head. They also noted a large pool of blood under his head, and he appeared to be bleeding. They also cited that dried blood was on his face, hands, and wrist. He did have a pulse, but he was drifting in and out of consciousness. The bathroom and bedroom were a disaster area. Someone had stripped the bed linens from the bed and a bloody sheet was laying on the floor. Bloodstains were also found on the mattress pillows, walls, nightstand, windowsill, and sliding closet doors that had been dislodged and now lay beside Brandon. Meanwhile, in the bathroom, the shower was running and the toilet tank lid was busted and lay on the floor next to the toilet, which had been pulled from the wall and was leaking. Someone had also clogged the toilet with huge gobs of toilet paper. The mirror was also shattered. Sadly, Brandon would die the next day. Detectives would start their investigation. They found contusions on his back, which were consistent with being struck with a hard object, such as a metal rod or bat, and could not be self-inflicted. Several drug tests were performed, but they came back negative, although he had taken some Benadryl. Detectives also found a pair of handcuffs and a black phone, along with several needles, which Brandon had a prescription for. Undopened cans of beer and women beauty products were also found. Even more strangely, Brandon's front door could only be locked from the outside, which led detectives to naturally assume whoever done this had left him injured as they walked out and locked the door behind them. Detectives would then run a report on his phone calls and found one interesting call that was traced to a woman that he knew. Now, I won't give her name here because she has never been formally named as a suspect or even a person of interest, but you can easily find it online. But she had been having an affair with Brandon for a while, and according to her, she was about to leave her husband for him. However, Brandon wasn't murdered, or at least, according to the medical examiner, who didn't even go to the crime scene, because apparently in North Carolina, medical examiners do not have to go to the scene. That's where this mystery gets really crazy, because in spite of what the detectives found, and despite their original conclusions that he had been murdered, the medical examiner ruled that Brandon died from pneumonia 
and I wish I was making that up, but I'm not. Now this case is super long, and I just can't do it justice in this format. But basically, the investigation was closed after the medical examiner's finding, and Brandon's mother has long claimed that there is a cover-up by police, and that the aforementioned girlfriend, or her husband, was involved. However, as of today, the case remains closed. Cape Ripper Summer of 1993, in Cape Town, South Africa, police would be called to the scene of a murder that had been found next to the N7 highway. The woman's body was in the bushes and half buried in the sand with only the feet above ground. Detectives immediately deduced that she had been strangled with a shoestring or something similar. The woman was missing one earring, but other than that, seemed to still have her possessions on her, thus ruling out robbery. Upon examination by a medical examiner, it was determined the woman had not been sexually assaulted. Investigators would start looking over missing persons reports, but found no one matching the victim. They would then ask other police departments throughout the country, and again, no missing persons report had been made for this woman. Detectives at this point were fairly certain she had been a sex worker. They would go to the areas where prostitutes were known to work, asking for help in identifying the woman. The women here would tell detectives that there was actually a woman missing who usually worked the area, and they identified her as 30-year-old Marilyn Prescent. Investigators would inquire about when the last time they had seen her was, and what vehicle she had gotten into. Unfortunately, they did not know. But before detectives could go any further, barely a week later, another deceased woman was found in the bushes across town. This time, the woman was completely nude and was located next to a wealthy suburb. Investigators quickly concluded that their murder did not happen here, but was just the dumping ground. And again, the woman died by strangulation and bore a similar mark around the neck. And again, there was no sexual assault. Of course, investigators were confident that the cases were connected, and the lead detective would send out a fax to all the police departments in the region looking for similar unsolved murders. And within a week, they had 10 cases that were similar, and investigators narrowed those down to a few which they felt were linked, and some of those went back to 1992. The next couple of years, it would quieten down, but it started up again when in January 1997, another body was found by a farmer clearing off his land. The body was very decomposed and had been killed a month prior. Again, she had not been sexually assaulted, but was placed like she had been, and again, it was strangulation. She was later identified as 35-year-old Gloria Samuels. A task force was then formed with 10 detectives and 50 officers, of whom would interview several sex workers while also running down several leads. Meanwhile, a reward was posted. However, this did little to curb the threat, because late March, early April, three more bodies were found in a short span of time, and at least one of these was linked to the serial killer. Detectives eventually found a suspect with a 60-year-old man named George Weir. He drove a blue pickup truck that was often seen in the area where some of the murdered women had disappeared from. They would actually arrest him on an old domestic violence warrant and searched his car, and they found an earring and makeup that matched the same kind that victim Gloria Samuels had used. Once back at the police station, the criminal profiler would later tell detectives she was sure they had found their killer. Unfortunately, they had no evidence to lock him up, and he was let go. And even more frustrating, they did not have the manpower to follow him 24-7. Shortly after this, two more women would die while he was out on bail, and he was arrested shortly after this. He was taken to a mental institution, where he was declared fit to stand trial, but after a year in prison, charges were dropped because detectives could not find any evidence linking him. Not surprisingly, while he was in prison, the murder stopped. It is suspected he murdered at least 20 women. Chalice Paul. This is a name you may remember from earlier videos in this iceberg, when we did two separate mysteries. One was on Colleen Wood, who vanished in Florida in 2000, and the second was race car driver slash drug dealer slash all-around jerk John Paul Sr., who was not only responsible for Colleen's disappearance, but also vanished himself after doing whatever he'd done to Colleen. 
And in that story, I mentioned a woman named Chalice Paul, who married John Paul Sr. way back in 1980, nearly 18 years before he met Colleen. Within a year of their marriage, the two would separate. After Chalice saw his real side, which often involved infidelity and his connections with various drug dealers, not to mention his temper, which was well known throughout the racing world and among his family and friends. I mean, this is the same guy that went to prison for trying to murder his partner who was helping him run drugs because he was afraid he was going to rat on him. But back to Chalice. After the two had separated, Chalice would move from their home in Georgia and head to Palm Beach, Florida at the end of 1980. By the summer of that year, Chalice was lucky enough to be cast in a movie called Sharky's Machine, which was being filmed in Atlanta. So while Chalice was there, John would swing by to visit her. He would then convince her to come back to his home in Key West so they could try to have a second honeymoon before the filming. And it's after this that Chalice vanished. And not surprisingly, John never bothered to even tell anyone she vanished because he was obviously behind it. Her family did report it though, but John would tell people later on that she left voluntarily and the last time he seen her was at a bar in Key West. However, one issue that really messed up the early investigation was Chalice's own sister who gave several conflicting reports and version of events about the last time she had seen Chalice. So much so that some people think she was actually complicit in her disappearance. That's unfortunately pretty much it. I mean, we don't have a lot of info available, at least publicly, but it's thought by most that he probably killed Chalice and dumped her into the ocean, which is what many think happened to Colleen. The only thing different about this one is the possible involvement of Chalice's sister. Charles Rogers 43-year-old Charles Rogers was an American seismologist and pilot who lived in Houston, Texas up until 1965. Charles was known to be highly intelligent and spoke seven languages, as well as having a talent for finding gas, oil, and gold for the companies in which he worked. And Charles lived with his elderly parents, 81-year-old Fred and 79-year-old Edwina in the Montrose neighborhood of Houston. Now Charles, in spite of all his intelligence, was a bit weird. He was reported to be a recluse and would only communicate with his parents by way of notes slipped under the door. Neighbors would even report later on that they were totally unaware that Charles even lived there as he usually left before dawn and didn't return home till after dark. And that June, the nephew of Edwina would call the police to report that he had been calling his aunt for several days and could not get a hold of her, and he requested a welfare check. When Houston officers arrived, they would knock, but not get an answer. They would eventually force their way in to check on the elderly couple. They didn't see anything weird, but did notice some food was sitting on the dining table. One officer would curiously check the fridge and see numerous cuts of what he thought was washed, unwrapped meat stacked on the shelves. He assumed it to be hog, and in true horror scene fashion, as he was closing the fridge door, he noticed two human heads visible through the clear glass of the vegetable bin. The heads were that of Fred and Edwin Rogers. Looking back up to those unwrapped cuts of meat, the officer realized those were the dismembered limbs and torsos of the Rogers. Police would begin to search the area for other remains, and while they didn't find anything in the home, organs would be found in the nearby sewer, which had been flushed down the toilet. Detectives determined that the Rogers had been killed on Father's Day, and an autopsy showed that Fred had been bludgeoned to death with a claw hammer. His eyes had been gouged out and genitals removed. Edwina had been beaten and shot, execution style in the head. The bodies were dismembered upstairs by a person with some knowledge of anatomy. There was little blood in the residence, and it appeared to have been cleaned thoroughly. The little blood that was found was in Charles's room, where they found a bloodstained saw. A search for Charles was launched, and he has never been found. And I don't want to get too deep down the crazy rabbit hole, but 30 years later, a book was written which linked Charles Rogers to the assassination of JFK, and it claimed that Charles was a CIA agent who impersonated Lee Harvey Oswald in Mexico City and then later on was the actual assassin. And the reason he killed his parents 
was because his mom had discovered that he was behind it. Yeah, it's a crazy theory, so I'll move on. Another theory that's way more sensible comes from a Houston couple who investigated the case for years and released a book about it. They claimed that he killed them because his father was abusive while both parents were known to be con artists. According to them, Fred was a bookie who engaged in illegal activities such as gambling and fraud, and they further claimed that the parents were stealing large sums of money from Charles, so he killed them, fled to Mexico, where he was aided by some powerful friends, then made his way to Honduras, where he was killed in a wage dispute with miners, although to me, wouldn't it have just been easier for Charles to move out? Other theories say he escaped to Canada, while others claim he was living off the land in Big Thicket National Preserve. Codex Gigas. The Codex Gigas is the largest medieval illuminated manuscript in the world, measuring 36 inches at length, 20 inches wide, and almost 9 inches thick, and weighing 165 pounds. The manuscript, which is known as the Devil's Bible, due to this highly unusual full-page portrait of Satan, is surrounded in legend and mystery. We do know the manuscript was created in the early 13th century in the Benedictine Monastery of Podlasis in the modern-day Czech Republic. The manuscript contains a complete Latin translation of the Bible, as well as other popular works, all written in Latin. The book binding is wooden boards covered in leather with ornate metal guards and fittings. Its illuminations include red, blue, yellow, green, and gold. The writing is unchanged throughout, showing no signs of age, disease, or mood on part of the scribe, which has led to the belief that the book was written in a very short time, but most scientists believe it took 20 to 30 years to complete. The book originally contained 320 sheets, but 12 of these were removed, by whom or why is unknown. The Devil's Portrait, as mentioned, is the most famous image of the entire codex. The illustration, which looks like it belongs on an 80s metal album cover, has fueled speculation about the reasons behind its creation, which actually kind of goes into the legend of the Codex's recording. According to this legend, the Codex was written by a monk named Herman the Recluse, who lived at the monastery. Allegedly, he was condemned to be walled up alive and starved to death for breaking his monastic vows. But to avoid this harsh penalty, he promised to create in one night a book to glorify the monastery forever, which included all human knowledge Near midnight, it became obvious that he could not complete the task alone and made a special prayer, but not to God. Instead, to Lucifer, who he asked to help finish the book in exchange for his soul. The devil then completed the manuscript, and the monk added his portrait out of gratitude. And since this is a legend, we don't really know who was behind it, or why he even made it. But one theory, probably the one that makes the most sense, is in this codex, you have the Bible with the most popular encyclopedia of its day, some medical text, a calendar, some local history, philosophy, foreign alphabets, and even some magic spells. This was probably just a very useful all-around book for the medieval needs at the monastery. Another theory is that some rich nobleman paid a scribe to secretly record all of this information for some unknown reason. Colin Michael Good. Colin Good was a 51-year-old recluse living in his isolated home near Claris, New Zealand. The former gardener of Auckland City Council was known to have minimal contact with the outside world, but even so, after nearly two months of no one seeing him, local residents grew concerned, and on June 30, 1999, his body would be discovered in his home. He was lying on a double bed in the master bedroom, where the remains of his dog were also found. Strangely, Michael's right hand was missing. In addition, two rifles were found in his bedroom, but there were no gunshot wounds. Despite a comprehensive medical exam, no cause of death could be established. And while we know his hand was removed, other injuries to his arms and other hand have not been released. And it was confirmed that the dog did not eat the right hand. In addition to being known as a recluse, Michael was also known to be a cannabis grower which might relate to the crime, because eight years earlier, in 1991, he had been assaulted in his home by armed men 
demanding about 30 pounds of cannabis they thought he had, but they end up taking only two pounds and $1,200. After a thorough investigation, investigators were stumped. They would actually consult the FBI a year later in hopes that they could help, yet nothing came from that either. And two decades later, the case is extremely cold. That's pretty much it on this one. It's super obscure and not much out there. Coral Castle. Another one that is probably not really obscure is Coral Castle in Miami-Dade County, Florida. It is home to numerous large stones, each weighing several tons, sculpted into a variety of shapes, including slab walls, tables, chairs, a crescent moon, fountain, and sundial. It's mainly famous for the mystery around how it was built, which was said to have been done by a man named Edward Lids Conan, who didn't use any modern equipment to build it. The castle consists of around 1,100 tons of stone and are fastened together without mortar. They just sit on top of each other, using their weight to keep them together, but they are connected with such precision that no light passes through the joints. And even after decades, the stones have not shifted. So how did he do it? That's a good question. The more fanciful theories cite some type of supernatural ability, like psychic powers, or even that he was singing to the stones. Some say he had an arcane understanding of magnetism and the so-called earth energies. Ed himself would tell people that he understood the laws of weight and leverage well, which was odd considering he only had a fourth grade education. But most likely, it just came down to hard work and the principles of leverage. Count of Saint Germain. The Count of Saint Germain was a mysterious figure who lived in the 18th century. He claimed to be an alchemist, musician, and diplomat, and was known for his extensive knowledge in various subjects, including philosophy, art, and science. The Count appeared in several European courts and social circles during his lifetime, gaining the attention and fascination of many people. The true identity and origin of the Count remain unknown and is shrouded in speculation. He often presented himself as an immortal being, hinting at having lived for several centuries and possessing the secret of eternal life. Throughout his life, the Count fascinated and perplexed those around him with his alleged abilities, such as his knowledge of languages, remarkable music talents, and his alleged ability to turn bass metals into gold. He was known to associate with influential individuals of his time, including the European royalty and high-ranking officials. The true nature of his abilities and the extent of his knowledge remain subjects of speculation and debate. Some believed him to be nothing more than an extraordinary charlatan, while others consider him to possess genuine occult knowledge, while paranormal theories suggest that he was an alien or possibly even a time traveler. Daniel Morgan 37-year-old Daniel Morgan of Sydenham, London was a private investigator for Southern Investigations, a company that he had founded with his business partner, Jonathan Reese. And on March 10th, 1987, after having a drink with Reese, Daniel would leave the Golden Lion Pub. Later, a BBC sound producer, who was making his way across the pub parking lot, would find Daniel lying face up with an axe embedded into his head. Police arrived on scene and discovered his Rolex had been stolen, yet his wallet and a large sum of money had been untouched. However, the pocket of his trousers had been torn open and notes he had earlier been writing were missing. And here is where the shenanigans begin. Because the detective assigned to the case was a man named Sid Fillory. Sid, well, he didn't reveal to his superiors that he had actually been working unofficially for Southern Investigations, which obviously could hinder the investigation. And, sure enough, a month later, six individuals, including Detective Fillory and business partner Jonathan Reese, and Reese's brothers-in-law, Glenn and Gary Vian, as well as two Metropolitan Police officers, were all arrested on suspicion of murder. However, they were eventually released with no charge. A year later, in April 1988, an inquest into the death would begin. The allegations were that Reese and Daniel's partnership had deteriorated badly. Reese had also allegedly told an accountant at Southern Investigations that officers at the Catford Police Station, who were friends of his, were going to murder Daniel or would arrange his murder. 
and that Fillory would then replace Daniel as Reese's partner. Reese denied this, of course, and Fillory would retire from the police department on medical grounds and quickly join Southern Investigation as Reese's business partner, where he was later alleged to have tampered with evidence and attempted to interfere with witnesses during the inquiry. And if we go back to the prior summer, just months after Daniel's murder, another interesting case would be tied to this one, that of Detective Constable Alan Holmes, a friend of Daniel's who was found to have died by suicide under mysterious circumstances. Daniel and Holmes had allegedly been working together to unveil police corruption. However, this was dismissed by an independent investigation. In the years since, there have been four separate police inquiries into Daniel's death. In these have been found allegations of police corruption, drug trafficking, and robbery. Over the years, there have been multiple arrests of basically the same group of men, Reese and the corrupt police officers, but there has never been enough evidence to actually convict someone. Reese and those accused have always claimed that Daniel was murdered by a jealous husband. And it was true that Daniel was having an affair with a woman named Margaret Harrison, whom he had met at a wine bar at 6.30 shortly before he was murdered at 9 p.m. Yet, there's no evidence that she or her husband were responsible. This is another one where everyone seems to know who's guilty. It's just a matter of proving it. Dark fluid. Dark fluid is a hypothetical form of matter that has been proposed as a possible explanation for certain cosmological observations. It is an alternative to dark matter and dark energy, which are also theoretical concepts used to explain phenomena in the universe. Dark fluid is suggested as a unified description of both dark matter and dark energy. Combining their effects into a single entity, it is posited to have attractive gravitational properties like dark matter, which can explain the observed gravitational effects on galaxies and galaxy clusters. At the same time, it would also possess negative pressure, similar to dark energy, which is responsible for the accelerating expansion of the universe. The idea of dark fluid is based on the notion that dark matter and dark energy might be interconnected or two manifestations of the same underlying substance. By considering a fluid-like substance with specific properties, scientists have explored the possibility of reconciling the effects of dark matter and dark energy into a unified framework. However, dark fluid is purely a theoretical concept and has not been confirmed. Death Crawler The world's largest living centipede is the Peruvian giant yellow leg centipede, which reaches 10 to 12 inches, with one that was even discovered up to 18 inches. It's known to feed on frogs, birds, lizards, rodents, and even bats. But what if there's a centipede that's much larger than this one? According to this cryptid mystery, in the unexplored regions of the Amazon lies a centipede that is several times the length of the giant yellow leg centipede. And although the animal planet has taken a look at the death crawler in an episode on their television series called Lost Tapes, the show's premise is largely based on fiction, so there's really nothing much from it to discuss. There's also not much about it online. It seems like this one definitely leans toward being fiction, or at least, if it's real, it's rarely seen. Detroit Jane Doe On September 30th, 1967, Detroit police would get a call about a young deceased woman found in an alleyway behind 3613 Liddesdale Street. As detectives arrived on the scene, her death was quickly ruled a homicide, yet police have never released any details about what happened. The murder had taken place very recently, so the woman's facial features were still clear and easily identifiable. Yet in the 50 plus years since, she has never been identified. It is believed the woman was between 18 and 22 and was about 5 foot 4. She had dark brown or black hair in a short afro and had brown eyes. She had a thin frame and was around 105 pounds. This is another one that just doesn't have a lot of information, so I will move on. Devil's Footprints On the night of February 8th and 9th in 1855, a heavy snowfall would hit the area of X Estuary in East and South Devon, England. When the locals awoke the next morning, they were somewhat surprised to see a series of hoof-like marks that appeared in the snow. These footprints 
which were about 4 inches long, 3 inches across, and between 8 to 16 inches apart, and mostly in single file, were reported from more than 30 locations across Devon and a couple in Dorset. It is estimated that the tracks were between 40 to 100 miles. Rivers, haystacks, and other obstacles were traveled straight over, and this included houses. Yep, footprints were visible on tops of snow-covered roofs, as well as leading up drain pipes. The prints were said to look very similar to that of a donkey shoe, while others stated it looked like clawed footmarks of an unclassifiable form. There's also accounts that hunters and hounds followed the tracks to a forest and that the hounds were treated in fear and the hunters were too afraid to go in. However, many skeptics have pointed out that if this event even did occur, it's doubtful the tracks extended as far as claimed because no one could have followed that entire set of tracks in one day. Secondly, the eyewitness descriptions of the footprints varied from person to person. But for the people who do believe the story, there's actually a few good theories. One in particular cited that an experimental balloon was released by mistake from the dockyard. This balloon had two trailing shackles on the end of its mooring ropes, and as the balloon was carried away by the wind, the shackles were dragged through the snow, and the dockyard did not tell anyone this because the balloon ended up breaking some windows and wrecking greenhouses, and they did not want to pay for that. The balloon did finally land in Huntington, yet people who disagree with this theory cite that the odds of a balloon not getting snagged up in a tree would probably have been small. Another suggestion was that of hopping mice or some other kind of rodent. This was actually one of the very first theories suggested. Other mammal theories was that of a badger which was native to the area. Another theory was that it was just a hoax or mass hysteria or that it never even happened. And of course at the time, a lot of people thought it was the devil. And there's probably people that still believe that, but others believe it was a cryptid. Diana, Hunter of Bus Drivers On August 28, 2013, at around 7.45 a.m., on a bus route in Ciudad Juarez, a woman who had been waiting on a bus would finally board 718, climb the steps, pulled a gun, and shot the driver. That bus driver, 45-year-old Jose Carrera, then jumped out in order to escape, but only made it as far as the sidewalk before collapsing and dying. By the time authorities arrived, the woman was long gone, but detectives would speak to witnesses who described her as a middle-aged woman with dyed blonde hair or maybe a wig, wearing a cap, plaid shirt, and jeans. Nobody seen where she fled to, or if they did, they were too afraid to say. The next morning, on that same exact route, a woman would board a bus downtown and after a few blocks requested a stop. As she walked towards the exit and motioned as if she was looking for bus fare, she instead drew her gun and said to the driver, quote, you all think you are so tough, end quote, and then shot him twice in the head before fleeing the scene. That driver, Freddie Morales, 32, would also die. If that story wasn't weird enough, the following day, a news website from El Paso called La Palaca would receive an email that read, quote, You think that because we are women, we are weak. And that may be true, but only up to a point. Because even though we have nobody to defend us, and we have to work long hours until late into the night to earn a living for our families, we can no longer be silent in the face of these acts that enrage us. We were victims of sexual violence from bus drivers working the Maquila night shifts here in Juarez, and although a lot of people know about these things we've suffered, nobody defends us, nor does anything to protect us. That's why I am an instrument that will take revenge for many women, for we are seen as weak, but in reality we are not. We are brave, and if we don't get respect, we will earn that respect with our own hands. We, the women of Juarez, are strong." End quote. This email was signed off on by someone called Diana, hunter of bus drivers, so what was this woman referencing? Although I wasn't able to find an exact date, it appears that in the 90s, several young women in Juarez began to disappear. Or should I say, that's when they first began to be recorded. The first time these began to be connected was after a 13-year-old was kidnapped and found dead with signs of sexual assault and strangulation. After that, the numbers killed began to grow. It went from dozens a year 
to hundreds a year, with the number peaking at 304 in 2010. The circumstances were very similar to a girl on her way to work or a girl on their way home would vanish. Sometimes, the girl would be found in a desert or in an abandoned lot with traces of sexual assault and torture. Sometimes, they were found in mass graves. And of course, since most of these girls would vanish on their way home or to work, a lot of them were last seen on the bus, which of course led to speculation. And it was, and maybe still is, known that many women are cautioned against getting on a bus where they could end up being alone with a driver because it's not super uncommon that a bus driver would be arrested for sexual assault. However, the drivers killed by Diana were not actually implicated in any crime. So were they just victims because they drove a bus? Or did they have a bad interaction with Diana? No one knows, but Diana seemed to disappear after this, and there's actually no proof that the email sent in by this Diana the Hunter actually came from the woman behind the shootings. What is known is she did scare the city's bus drivers for years, as many of them began to keep a sketch of the woman near their dashboard and would actually start forbidding any woman that looked like her to get on board. Dino Bravo Adolfo Bresciano, or known by his stage name, Dino Bravo, was a professional wrestler known mostly for his run in WWF from 1986 to 1982. But wrestling, like a lot of professional sports, is still just a business. At the end of the day, it's about making money. And at the end of his run in 1992, WWF felt they no longer needed him and let his contract lapse. But Bravo had been accustomed to the high lifestyle. He drove a Mercedes and had a big home. And now all of a sudden, that income was gone. And Bravo, being a guy that had no experience in any other business except wrestling, didn't know where to turn to. Not that he could have tolerated being a 9-to-5 guy, but he didn't have many options. However, Bravo did have one connection, that of his uncle, Vincenzo Catroni, who was head of the Catroni Mafia family in Montreal, and he had long offered Bravo a job to come work for him, and he actually did at one point, working as a chauffeur. Yet, Bravo did not want to actually be involved with the criminal underworld, even though he was assured by his uncle he could make great money. However, with his money running out and now being forced to borrow from his mother, he eventually gave in and became involved in the cigarette trafficking that started up in Canada in the early 90s. A lot of people were doing it, as it basically was just a form of tax evasion. But Bravo would actually do really well because the indigenous peoples that were smuggling the cigarettes were huge wrestling fans. So they started dealing with Bravo only, so much so that he had a monopoly, which, you know, I'm sure didn't make the other smugglers happy. But he also drew the attention of cocaine dealers. One in particular was a huge name in the trade and asked Bravo for a cut of the cigarette deal in exchange for a cut of his cocaine deal. And apparently, this would eventually lead to an incident where Bravo would set a shipment worth 400000 or about 850000 in today's money in a warehouse for this guy to pick up. And the cocaine guy waited three days to pick it up. And the police were waiting on him when he got there. This led to Bravo and the other guy blaming each other. While Bravo claimed he should have picked it up on the first day like they had planned. About a week later, Bravo's wife would enter her home to find him with 11 bullets in his head. There was blood everywhere. There was no forced entry and there was snow on the ground, yet no shoe prints. Detectives concluded that Bravo let someone in most likely to watch the hockey game with him. And at some point, this suspect most likely said he needed to go to the bathroom, and then they returned and just shot him in the back of the head. Investigators reached this conclusion because the remote control was still loose in Bravo's hand, and apparently, if he had seen it coming, he would have tensed up, thereby gripping the remote. And to this day, the murder is unsolved. It does seem like Bravo at least suspected it was coming, as he had told his friend, Bret Hart, shortly before his death, that his days were numbered. However, it should be noted, it's never been conclusively linked to his cigarette smuggling. Dulce Maria Alaves, on April 25th, 2019, in Bridgeton, New Jersey, five-year-old Dulce Alaves and her brother would be taken to get ice cream by their mother, Noema, 
and shortly after, to the city park where the two would play on the swing set. Noemma would walk back to her car, just 30 yards away, where she helped her younger sister with her homework and also played a scratch-off lottery ticket. Now, although she was just 30 yards away, there was a small hill between her car and the swing set, so she could not see them completely. I've seen this next part towed several ways, so I'm not sure which one is accurate, but we do know that the time was between 4 and 5 p.m. Depending on which source you believe, Noemi went to check on her kids when they did not come back into her field of vision within a few minutes, or her little sister went to check on them and only found her crying three-year-old son, or Noemi went herself to check and found only her son there crying, or her son came back to the car crying. Regardless, we know within a few minutes of letting the kids play on the swing set, Noemi would check and found her three-year-old son crying and five-year-old Dulce was missing. When Noemi asked where his sister was, he could only point behind a building. She at first thought that he had been playing hide-and-seek, but after searching and not being able to find Dulce, she immediately called the police, who responded with 30 officers. The search party would go into the nearby woods, where they thought she may have wandered off, but found nothing. Shortly after this, a witness came forward and stated that they seen a light-skinned Hispanic man between 5'6 and 5'8, with a thin build, no facial hair, but had acne on his face. This man was walking with Dulce to a red van. Strangely, after the abduction, Noema would talk to the press and stated people were, quote, judging me because of what I did in the past. Just because of my past doesn't mean I'm doing the same thing, end quote. Now, she never clarified what this was in reference to, but she followed it up by saying, quote, has nothing to do with the problems we had in the past or people we have trouble. Why her? Why does she have to pay the consequences? She's just a small girl. She doesn't even know. End quote. Of course, this has led to all kinds of conjecture and rumors. There was even a rumor that Noema was arrested. It got to be so bad that the local police department had to go on social media to clarify that Noema was not being looked at and they did not think she was involved with her daughter's disappearance. The prosecutor would take this a step further and ask people to stop spreading rumors so law enforcement could focus on the real abductor. Dulce's father was in Mexico at the time and is not a suspect. Neither is Noema's current boyfriend who was working in Philadelphia at the time. However, they have spoken to at least 75 people and stopped numerous red vans seen on surveillance footage or found through registration records. No physical evidence was found after combing a one and a half mile radius, the theory in this one is pretty obvious. Dulce was the victim of a non-family abduction, by who is unknown. Although, there are a significant amount of people that believe Noema had something to do with it. But, it seems like law enforcement disagrees with that assumption. Dungaven Hooter The Dungaven Hooter is another cryptid that comes from the tales of lumberjacks that worked in the North American forest in the 19th and early 20th century. The creature was said to be spotted in the marshlands between Maine and the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. It's described as a deadly alligator-like creature, except strangely, its jaws are fused shut, with two immense nostrils taking up most of its snout. It has short legs and a thick, powerful tail, and it makes no noise except for a whiffling snort. The creature is said to be 15 to 20 feet long, which half of that is tail, they also weigh, on average, about 2,500 pounds. It was known to prey on lumberjacks by hiding behind a bush, and then when one walked by, he would leap out and knock it to the ground with its tail. It especially enjoyed going after drunk prey, as they're drawn to the high concentration of alcohol in their blood. After the lumberjack was knocked down, the creature would then pound the person with its tail, or jump up and down on him, until they turned him into vapor, which the cryptid then used its large nostrils to inhale because their digestive systems are so finely tuned that they can extract nutrients from gases and vapors alone, allegedly. They are comfortable on land and in the water, but tend to remain near water sources. Most cryptozoologists now think that this creature was really just an alligator, although I don't know where that comes from since there are no alligators in Maine or Michigan. Elsie Walker, 16-year-old Elsie Walker lived with her aunt and uncle 
at Papa Moa, New Zealand in the 1920s, and on the night of October 1st of 1928, around midnight, Elsie would simply vanish from the home, leaving her aunt and uncle to realize it the next morning and call the police to form a search party. Unfortunately, the party found nothing, not one clue, until five days later, when Elsie would be found by two young boys after they had seen her feet protruding from a clump of manuka. And sadly, she was deceased. There was blood on her hair, and some had flowed onto her face, where it had came to rest in a small pool of blood, and near her right hand was a small handkerchief with blood stains. But what made it strange was that her body was recovered nearly 200 miles away on the outskirts of Auckland, and nobody knows how she got there. Detectives also could not find any visible signs of violence on the girl, although a later medical examination did reveal a fractured skull. However, the pathologist could not be certain that that was the cause of her death. In fact, they could never find exactly what did kill her, although they did rule out natural causes, obviously, and agreed the fractured skull could have contributed to the death, but they couldn't even determine if it was an accidental blow or homicide. The mystery would draw the public's interest for months, and the police were highly criticized for their investigation, which seemed to continually falter in lieu of the fact that they kept getting new evidence. One key piece of this evidence was that a car her uncle owned disappeared at the same time Elsie did, and that car would also be found 200 miles away from the home the day after it was stolen and was found just seven miles away from where Elsie's body was found. But Elsie couldn't drive. Even weirder was the witness that seen the car pull up and identified it, stated that when it arrived, two men got out carrying a dress basket about 2 p.m. and walked away. For whatever reason, she was never interviewed by the detectives, though there was interest in a 28-year-old farmer named William Bailey, who was actually Elsie's cousin. He would be hanged five years later after the murder of his neighbors. He was considered a key person in the investigation of Elsie's disappearance, but was regarded as a mystery as to if and how he was involved. His movements at the time of her disappearance were investigated exhaustively, and he was questioned numerous times over several months, but detectives could never prove if he was involved or not. Actually, they were never even able to determine the circumstances leading up to Elsie's disappearance and her death. The main theory in this one is obviously that it was her cousin that was responsible. Falcon Lake Incident The year is 1967, in River Heights, Winnipeg, Stephen Michalak, aka Stephen, worked as an industrial mechanic and was also an amateur geologist working as a prospector searching for quartz and silver at Falcon Lake. He had actually staked a claim in the Falcon Lake area and was there one weekend in May, which is when our mystery begins. While inspecting the quartz vein, he would be startled by the sounds of a flock of geese who got agitated by an object. According to Stephen, he looked up and seen two objects hovering about 150 feet away from him that emitted a reddish glow. They were cigarette shaped and he originally assumed they were American experimental aircraft. Stephen would state that one of these objects would land on a nearby rocky platform and took on a disc shape while the other craft flew off after hovering for several minutes. While observing the landed craft, he would start to sketch the object that sat in front of him for half an hour before finally approaching it. As he got closer, he could find no insignia and noticed it looked smooth, resembling colored glass. It was about 34 feet in size and 15 feet in height. The craft would change colors between gray and red, sort of like hot stainless steel with a golden glow around the vehicle. He would also recall the smell of sulfur and the warm air emitted by the craft and also heard the sounds of a whirring motor as well as a hissing sound. One side of the craft had an open door on it with bright lights and within the craft, he could hear the voices of something that was muffled. He did say they sounded human though. Stephen would call out and ask if the pilots needed help, to which the two individuals then got silent. When he did not hear anything, he attempted to speak to them in Polish, Russian, and German. Again, nothing. He would then put on his welding goggles for protection and approach the craft even closer. He would see light beams and panels flashing various colors. He looked inside and the craft appeared empty, 
and as he walked away, three panels slid in to seal the craft, and then he reached out to touch it. It was so hot that the fingertips of the gloves melted. The craft then turned counterclockwise, revealing a panel with a grid of holes, and emitted a blast of heated gas which hit him in the chest, blew him backward, and set his clothing on fire, which he immediately tore off as the vehicle flew away. Stephen became disoriented, nauseous, and started to vomit and attempted to return to his motel where a nearby police officer spotted him and assumed he was drunk. This officer would later state he did not smell any alcohol on Stephen, so he offered to take him to a hospital, which Stephen declined. However, Stephen disputed this and said that he actually asked the officer for help and the officer was dismissive of his claim. Regardless, he would take a bus home and seek medical attention, where he was then admitted to the emergency room. And it was here that the grid-like pattern of raised sores from his burns were looked at, and these burns matched his story. He continued to suffer from headaches, diarrhea, blackouts, and weight loss. He was given a psychiatric test, which stated that he was of sound mind. He would continue to suffer from intermittent reappearances of his burns until he died 32 years later in 1999. So what to make of this crazy story? Well, the skeptical claim is Stephen had a car accident stemming from alcohol use and that he was trying to cover it up, while simultaneously trying to keep competing prospectors away by making up the UFO story, which had the opposite effect because more people started showing up looking at the site. Furthermore, the alleged skin lesions were said to be nothing more than an allergic reaction, and the claim that Stephen hadn't been drinking that weekend was disputed by a bartender at the hotel where Stephen had been staying. He had served him at least five bottles of beer the night before the encounter. However, others still think this is the most conclusive UFO encounter in Canada. Flying Dinosaurs in North Carolina Pterosaurs, aka pterodactyls, are an extinct flying reptile that lived back in the time of the dinosaurs, going extinct a long, long time ago. Or did they? Apparently, there have been quite a few pterodactyl sightings in North Carolina, or at least, according to cryptozoologist Jonathan Wickham, who wrote the book, Modern Pterosaurs. In one of his interviews with a witness, he would talk to Cynthia Lee, who was studying to become a veterinary technician. She would state that on January 4th, 2021, she saw a flying creature that had no feathers and had a long tail with a diamond-shaped bulb at the end of it. The creature also had a head crest. She would actually end up seeing this creature again shortly after this, but her sighting is not the only one. In Charlotte, a man and his cousin reported seeing something in the air that reminded him of a dragon, remarking that it looked like something from a Jurassic Park movie. Another lady in Asheville saw a huge black winged creature fly very low over her car, and yet had no feathers but did have sharp edges to its features. While in Jacksonville, North Carolina, a witness would report seeing something huge in the sky that was pale greenish white and smooth skin. It had no feathers and had a tail with a diamond shape on the end. In addition, North Carolina is considered one of the top seven hotspot states for pterodactyl sightings in the U.S. However, scholars and skeptics are pretty dismissive. While saying it's not impossible, it is highly improbable. There would have been someone that came across the specimen by now. Others cite that people are just seeing a crane or a heron, while others claim it's nothing more than a hoax. Giant Scuttles Giant Scuttles are a cryptid that is said to be like that of a giant octopus. They have been spotted in the Bahamas and Caribbean by pearl divers and other oceanic workers. One fisherman would tell about an encounter when he was 12 years old and fishing with his father off of Vandross Island. His father hooked something he assumed to be rocks or debris. However, he was able to pull in his line, but only slowly and with much stress. Finally, at the bottom of the line, they saw a gigantic octopus. The animal detached itself from the hook and swam up at great speed towards the surface. When it reached the top, it clinged to the bottom of their boat. It only let go after they prodded it away with oars and hooks, and then it sank back into the ocean. Fishermen have said they are only dangerous if they can get a tentacle in the boat and another one around the hull, forming a vice grip, while another one is planted back on the ocean floor. It's also claimed they can use one of their tentacles to grab at occupants within the boat and drag them into the ocean 
where it drowns them. Strangely enough, these giant scuttles are not known to be dangerous to divers or swimmers, probably because they don't see a single human as a threat, or a boat is seen as threatening to them. The creature is said to have a tentacle span of 100 to 200 feet long and lives only in deep water. And obviously, this cryptid may actually be the creature behind the Kraken legend, or it may just be a giant octopus. Hill Family On the night of January 12th, 2002, the Hill family, consisting of Ruben, 56, Margarita, 26, and their children, Maria, 12, Osvaldo, 9, Sofia, 6, and Carlos, 4, would leave the town of Crucisita Septimus, where the Hills worked as landlords and in various other local jobs, to go visit a friend named Maximo Vega in a nearby town called Viale. Now, the Hill family worked for a man named Alfonso Goet, where, from what I could gather, was their landlord, which is odd since they were also landlords. Now, fast forward three months in April, and Alfonso would call Ruben's sister, Luisa, and tell her that the Hills had not returned from their three-month vacation that he had given them in January. First, this was kind of odd, because in all the years that the Hills had worked for him, he had never given them more than 10 to 15 days vacation before. Regardless, Luisa would file a missing persons report. Now, I don't know exactly why, but for some reason, an investigation into their disappearance wasn't ordered until the middle of 2003, over a full year later. But investigators would find that no neighbor nor relative knew what happened to the Hills, but had stated that they did not think they would have left on their own. They didn't even have a vehicle and Margarita had another job at the school in town where she never picked up her last check. Another strange thing that police found was that after searching phone records, they realized just the day after the family's disappearance, Ruben's cell phone made several calls to a woman residing in Rosario, whom they were unable to find. This cell phone would remain active for 15 months after the case. They also found out later on that a neighbor claimed that two days after their alleged disappearance, he actually seen Ruben on horseback. A forensic psychologist concluded that the Hills had no psychological or religious motives to sever ties with all of their loved ones. And although they had little contact with other families in the area, Ruben was known to be a very happy and sociable man. However, several witnesses reported his demeanor changed days before the disappearance as he had became silent and seemed very concerned. By 2008, a raid was carried out on La Candelaria Estancia, where the family worked, and the floor was raised, wells were dug out, and traces of blood were found. Yet, these didn't match the hills, although it was possible the samples become contaminated. There's not a lot of theories on this one, but there are some rumors. One is that of Alfonso Goet, who waited three months to tell any family that they went missing. His relationship with them was also said to have not been good. Alfonso had also told relatives that the Hills left their possessions in the home, including money and documents. But when these relatives showed up to search, they found none of this. They did find a burned mattress with blood mixed into the dirt. For Alfonso's part, he hinted that they went to Santa Fe to visit relatives or migrated northeast in search of work. If Alfonso did know anything about what happened, he took that secret to the grave. As the 70-year-old died in a car crash in 2016, his death would actually lead to an unexpected twist. When a witness came forward and said he had not wanted to speak out because of his fear of Alfonso, but this witness said that the Hills never went on a trip or even left the ranch. He also said that 20 days before they disappeared, Ruben had dug two wells. Now. If this was at the order from Alfonso, or if it's even related, is unknown. But there was also a witness that stated during the initial police search, they didn't actually search. Instead, Alfonso slaughtered a heifer and fed the police. This is one of those that's pretty easy to see who's most likely responsible. They just never had the evidence to arrest him. Graves of Old Swan, 1970s, in Old Swan, Liverpool, England. Plans were underway to demolish an old primary school that was over a century old 
and in its place, they plan to build two separate schools, one an elementary school and the other a junior high school. It was during the building of this junior high school that the parish priest, Father McCartney, came over and warned the foreman that there might be some unmarked graves at one end of the site. So before moving forward, the home secretary would sign an exemption order, and when they began to dig, they found an unmarked coffin at around 15 feet deep. Then they found another, and another, and another, and they would eventually find 3,561 graves, sitting in just 40 square yards under a garden. Of course, these were graves with coffins stacked, sometimes stacked 16 caskets high. These graves seemed to have came out of nowhere, as the city council had no knowledge of the graves, and it was actually only due to the priest that they were found at all. Not surprisingly, this put the city council in a jam, but they chose to minimize the discovery of the graves and proceeded to build anyways, although the discovery did cause a delay of a year and a half. This led to years of speculation and rumors by the locals about exactly when these graves were dug and just who were in them. At first, it was thought that it might have been victims of the Irish potato famine that happened between 1845 and 1852. However, old maps would dispute this because it was found that the graves had been there prior to 1830. And going back to the priest, Father Patrick James McCartney also noted he found the burials at the bottom of a garden in 1973. It appears that what happened with this mystery was just really poor city planning because before 1906, the area was known as a burial ground, but sometime between 1906 and 1956, the church chose to landscape the old, now unused graveyard. After this, everyone just sort of forgot about the graves, and the city planners didn't actually check the records, or they would have realized they were building on a grave site. And with these graves stacked up to 16 casket high, it led to rumors that these were plague pits, which was dismissed since plague victims were tossed into graves without caskets. Another rumor that got started was that these graves belonged to Irish immigrants who were massacred by the British government. Rumors abound that skulls with bullet holes were being found. Yet, when the bodies began to be exhumed, there was no evidence of this. But the rumors of a cover-up by the British government only got stronger when the bodies were ordered to be cremated, a move which the government claimed was just more logical than trying to move 3,500 bodies to somewhere else. Another thing that kind of rules out a massacre was that there were gravestones and plaques placed above them, and they were stacked neatly with the dates ranging over a number of years. But still, no one has any idea how these people ended up here concentrated in this one little area. Great Sheep Panic On the evening of November 3rd, 1888, at around 8 p.m., thousands of sheep would simultaneously bust out of the fenced-in fields or dwellings of over 20 different farms and would flee. The next morning, the herders would go out to try and find them, where they were widely scattered. Many were found hiding in terror under hedges, and many crowded into corners of fields, sometimes miles away from the field they had been in the previous evening. In the end, over 200 square miles of land seen sheep fleeing from their homes. It was obvious something had scared these animals badly, but what? It was quickly ruled out that this was caused by pranksters, as it would have been hard for a group of people to have frightened so many sheep over a 200 mile range. And there's not really a lot of info on this weird one, but I did find one theory. According to the scientific journal called Nature, they would cite that on that night, records showed, quote, an intensely dark night with occasional flashes of lightning, end quote. They went on to say that because sheep are such notoriously timid and nervous animals, the eerie dark night and lightning caused the reaction where more than likely one of them started to panic and it spread like wildfire and created a mass hysteria among the sheep that all ran from a perceived threat the first one seen. I don't know if I believe that one or not. However, one witness was recorded as saying it was a flocking disaster. And that is all for this edition of the Unsolved Mystery Mega Iceberg Explained. I hope you enjoyed.